but just woke, woke up at around six today. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Then, so what's, what's your morning ritual? Like what's your routine normally? Like you wake up and normally jump on the red light straight away or? Yeah. Generally get the red light in. Um, just, yeah, just water. Um, Ned has been making this amazing um, cold mm-hmm. brew at home. Oh yeah. So nice. Bit and then I usually uh, bust up with some work and then I go and train. And then I'm just in the sunshine for a bit, doing recovery. And usually I'd be really active, but um, things are pretty quiet here and mm. the beaches are closed. So, yeah. Yeah, it sucks. How's it going about you guys? Yeah, like we've, it's the same sort of thing. Like they, they put like the big lockdown on and you're not allowed to hang out in big groups and you can go for walks down the beach and stuff like that. But they've blocked off all the car parks yeah. around there. Yeah. So you can't actually. Like there's a few Shit. spots. Yeah. Not allowed to lay on the beach. If you're caught laying on the beach, apparently you get a thousand buck fine. Oh really? Yeah. I didn't not allowed know that. to It's not even law. That's just like a rule. <laughs> I know it's ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, like in America and stuff, people getting fined and, and jailed, and I'm like, you can't. It's not law. Like, what the hell are you? What the hell's going on? Yeah. It's crazy. Awesome. Yeah. When people are protesting hard. Like. I think we're on a weird like turn at the moment so mm. people are doing peace release so hopefully it works out like all across america it's, it's getting pretty crazy mm. yeah. yeah yeah i think it's um it's like really opening people's eyes i think to the corruption and mm. What's going the, on? the the push for push that they want to um put fear in people i guess yeah um, so yeah, it's good that people are standing up and making a bit of a stand and yeah, going against it. Mm. So, mm. see, right. yeah. how are you guys I, doing with the online stuff? Oh man, you know what? We're absolutely loving it. Hey, like, mm. really, really enjoying it. Yeah, like, it's extra time for us to train at home and you know, just do more of what we love. But then I feel like it's just opened the doors to expand more or express ourselves more in new areas mm. more so express yeah. yeah so you guys are having a blast on the farm huh yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so, good, <laughs> so eh? good so good yeah made a little barbecue out the back and like once a week we've been having these mad cook-ups and like sunday ah, afternoon we'll get a little fire going and yeah. sounds like i'm missing out <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. so it's good like um all right, so sh- uh, did you tell Dom how we stream the video? Yeah, so I'm just going to stream this live into our um, like our members group and then I'll just sort of capture the audio from that as well and then we'll put that on the podcast. So is that What's- totally cool? Um, yeah. Go ahead and do that now. So we, um, we open for time because we had a lot to discuss. That's what I wanted to check with you as well. Or did you want to keep it to an hour? Like what's generally... We're uh, sweet. I few, think we're yeah. pretty good for time. Like, I don't think we have to cap it at any specific time, do we? No, like, what what works for you? Like, we've been doing, like, an hour, hour and a half-ish, depending on, like, where how we go with the chats. But, like, what are you sort of um, available for? That's true. I mean, because, like, with the, cause you've got, we've got quite a few topics we wanted to touch. Like, literally, the podcast I just did with um, Jordan, yep. that was only two topics, and we ran two hours. So. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> yeah cool yeah i wasn't um yeah, like, to it. yeah cool well yeah i feel like if we um yeah we'll, we'll aim for like that hour and a half ish sort of a mark and um you see, see yeah, yeah see yeah. how we go and if it goes over like it's i'm not fast mm. it's all right but if it goes short then it's whatever yeah we'll do like a little <laughs> short <laughs> just give us like a give us like a little double blink or something if you're like come on let's wrap it up <laughs> yeah like <laughs> oh, I'm all good. I'm free. i've been looking forward to talk to you guys um, oh we could all right yeah, let me um let me get this stream happening <clears throat> how's your internet been over there dom um we just actually got it changed again yesterday but up to that like i was really nervous during the uh real movement presentation that I was going to cut out Mm. and it held up but this is supposedly meant to be even faster and stronger so how's my like movement and audio coming through to you guys sounds pretty good mm. sounds pretty good how's this been um... like, like a robot <laughs> no no it's not that bad 
Right. Yeah, you guys are crystal clear and good. So I think the internet should do us very well this time. Sweet. And everyone else should be able to sleep around the house. So. Yeah. Cool, cool. How's Nettie going? She good? She's good. She's in the corner here. Doing some oh, work. She also cool. also similar setup. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I work crushing her um, client feedbacks and stuff, and then so good. go to the gym as well. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. tell us we said hello. Sure. Um, What's that? Hello. Tell her we said hello. Yeah, sure. She's waving. <laughs> All right, this is almost um, ready to go. That would have been. Um, That'd have been cool for like streaming in front of the real movement the other day, hey? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, that was really fun. The feedback was amazing. Mm. Yeah. I was so glad that it was received so well. Yeah. And um, yeah, the time frame of it, I was sitting in the presentation, it was good practice. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. That's awesome. That's epic. All right. How did so you guys I haven't watched back at all as well. What was that? Sorry? You guys' uh, presentation as well, you got good feedback. Yeah, yeah, I had quite a few people actually message me saying that they really enjoyed it, so that was good. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, sweet. yeah, good way to get to quite a few people. I'm definitely going to watch back the whole weekend. Yeah, yeah so much, eh? So, so much, much stuff. I haven't had the time to go through. Like, <laughs> yeah, you guys have got Lucas, then Patrick, um, a few other people that I'm just like, all right, got to get on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's epic, eh? Um, that was a... I think it was um, the flexible that guy. Oh, have you flexible. seen him? Flexible um, with oh, Ben. In. I think he's in Ben Patrick's crew from ATG. His one was uh-huh. his his one was quite enjoyable. I caught like about twenty minutes of it, but it was all about like movement dynamics and how the there's no there's more than one way to basically do movements. And he sort of dived into a little bit about um, more so like the environment, like someone could do. Um, like a three-pointer time after time after time in practice, but then when they get to the game, they miss every shot. So he started talking about different factors that come into play in that. Yeah. So it was, it was really cool. So okay. I'll go check that one out as well. Yeah. <laughs> so much. <laughs> so much, hey? Damn it, Lewis. So many, yeah. Yeah. It's cool, though. Like, it's such a great idea. And, um, you know, just to get so many leaders or so many thought thought leaders like, like in that one in that one place walks mm. of life you know, in the movement scene and health industry yeah unbelievable yeah so all right so we are live we are live we are live <laughs> welcome guys <laughs> welcome so um this is dom dom um came to our facility at feel live and did an amazing workshop, a seminar on all things like ancestral health and longevity. And um, yeah, it was really, really amazing. And we found it so informative. Everyone that came got massive feedback. Like, really, we had really, really good feedback from it. Mm. So we thought, you know, well, let's jump on a call with him, do a podcast and we'll stream it live so that you guys can also get um, just as much value. So this is Dom. He's currently, do you want to explain why you're red? <laughs> <laughs> This is not my natural skin tone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my just my morning protocols um red light, so I get the um spectrums of sunrise and sunset mm. throughout the day. Um since I'm obviously not out the house early on the beach in Bali getting my natural light, I use the uh red light to get the collagen moving around my skin, get my, mm. my hormones producing to start the day. And uh yeah. We we mm. will touch more on this throughout the throughout this podcast, I guess. Wait. Yeah, that's why I'm red. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen them. I've seen it popping up. Twenty minutes, then you'll get to see what how hideous I really am. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, yeah, I've seen the red lights popping up quite a bit. I've um been drawn towards like checking them out or mm. investing in one. I've seen a few people popping up with them. Can you you feel differences within within a week? Oh yeah. wow! Awesome. That's um. Uh, yeah. Red light. Yeah, well, cool to. I mean, I work with it. Red Light Rising. Should check them out. They do a lot of informative um, posts about it daily. Um, they also have some of the best machines that have different specs that you want to look out for. I can cover this more greatly later if anyone's interested. But um, yeah, it's it's amazing for hormonal regulation. And also, I did, you know, I, I, I spoke a lot about um, 
how to deal with sunlight, especially if you're more Caucasian and more fair skin and mm. not having to wear damaging oils and, and skin products for, for sun um, exposure. And the red light actually helps you regulate your skin and adapt it into being able to take in more blue light and not burning as quickly or burning at all. Wow. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So it's yeah. Cool regulation light spectrums. It's, it's amazing stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool to um, look into. I've, um, I saw this, um, have you ever seen the, the machines and stuff where they expose you to a whole bunch of different lights? Um, what do they call that? <clears throat> bio, bio, is it that? Yeah, it's kind of like, um, there's a place in just down the road from us that has it and they're like a, it's a machine that has a whole bunch of different light frequencies that they'll expose you to in different oh, nice. sequences to sort of, um, that's more so to, change change your state or get you into altered states of um consciousness like into that therapeutic zone so yeah, use it for so that's more frequencies than the actual color of light mm. So. Yeah. Mm. yeah maybe there's so much bio this bio that nowadays and there's so much yeah. to keep up with <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's it wow. yeah I, um, um, cool I'll check. yeah so this morning i jumped on the scales down um down probably close to 12 kilos since you were here in um january is that january oh, you're yeah. Here? yeah yeah that's was it no it was uh was it february 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 yeah yeah it yeah. was so, february. February. so that's like yeah. nearly two months yeah so it's epic i um it's a huge it's huge months. shift yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's huge huge shift like um and it's funny, you go on like uh, the calorie guru guys and they're like, oh, I lost uh, 13 pounds in two months and here you are 12 kilos. Like, what's that in pounds? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, that'd be, it'd be probably be close to like 20, yeah. 24 pounds or something, eh? And not, not yeah, rain food or anything. Raining what you enjoy and just living your life, eating the amount of food that you want to eat. Like, awesome. Yeah. Hmm. It's, yeah, it's been epic. Like, like I think the... One of the biggest things I took away from, um, like when you were here, was like, you know, just eat when you're hungry, eat when you're full, eat until you're full. And yeah. like prior prior to that, I just had so much like thought in the back of my mind, thinking like, oh, I've got to eat this specific amount of calories, or I can't overeat and do all this stuff. And that whole time, I was just filling up on the wrong wrong stuff. And then for me, anyway, and mm. then um, yeah, just had so much doubt in my mind, but like. It's been honestly one of the most enjoyable yeah. and sustaining things I've ever done, I think. Yeah, That's yeah. Awesome. I mean, it yeah. sounds natural yeah. to the human being, right? Just get on with your life and your body shouldn't have to calculate how to stabilize your weight, right? Yeah, so, so true. Now. So awesome, man. Huge props. Yeah, thank you. And Thanks for the young um, right? Your strength is going through the roof, right? Yeah, 100%. That's the, that's the best part, like maintain, maintain strength, increasing on different lifts. And like the other side of that is I've found that my energy has just been like stable, or mm. like not stable, like just good all the time. It's not really any highs, lows or crashes or like just really hanging out for, for yeah. food. It's just... Yeah, so. I think stable is the right word, you know. It's just, it doesn't crash. And then it only rises when you're doing activity and stuff like that, obviously. So, yeah, that's yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, I guess like the first little topic that would be cool, that would be cool to, to dive, dive into is like, kind of like um, like uh, like uh, like just around like just around fasting, fasting, fasting and the healing properties of that of that and and, and that's, why it's why it's what's that sorry? Like, Mike was like crackling and reverbing a bit. Oh, was it? How's that? How's that sounding? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was just saying like one of the first topics to dive into would be um, like just all around like the intermittent fasting and how it, how well it goes with the carnivore diet um, and the healing properties that sort of surround that combination of the two. All right, cool. So we'll dive into that then. So... Generally, it's it's not something that has to be really thought of, as as you probably have felt. Um, when you start to 
eat more ancestrally based, when you start to up your fats and your proteins and you start to diminish the, the carbohydrates as such, you realize that um, you feel fuller for longer. Mm. So generally you're going more than four hours without eating after a meal. You don't have any hunger pangs. And this is why we see that generally when you're consuming um, this pattern, you start to adapt some kind of fast pattern, whether you consciously think about it or not. And as you well know, by doing so, you're actually you're eating a lot, but you're not eating as much as you previously would. And therefore, if you want to think in the calorie sense and go mm. with that updated science, you understand that you are in a deficit of some sort, which is why you'd probably lose weight pretty quickly. And the space in between the food that you're eating, the body is actually utilizing the nutrients and the stores that you have. So mm. therefore, it goes hand in hand. That's why we generally see anybody who's advocating this way of eating or is living this this relationship to food is generally going to be doing some fasting of some sort. Mm. But the typical norm that we start seeing is um, 16-8, which I mentioned mm. with you guys as the Egyptian scale, um, something I picked up also from uh, my studies in Egypt. But um, it's now just widespread everywhere. And everyone says, oh, it's intermittent fasting. First thing you think of, 16-8. That's, that's <laughs> the way, that's the only way, the most common way. Um, it's not necessarily true. I mean, I, I'll just ask you guys now, what's, what's your current fast pattern? How long are you generally fasting? Um, yeah, so for me, uh, for the last sort of week, week and a half, I've been doing the 23-1. Mm. And so, I'm doing the 16-8. Yeah. And you're doing the 16-8. All right, yeah. So there are two different examples. Um, so you find on the the twenty three one that the uh, when what time are you generally breaking your fast on that twenty three one? Well, like mid afternoon. Yeah, it's probably around like five six five six o'clock. I um I generally want to give myself at least two to three hours before bedtime before I eat. So it's always around that yeah five six o'clock mark. So and like and I make sure that. I've really been making sure that I eat that higher amount of fat at night time. Um, and I've felt that, you know, I'm getting to sleep quite easy. Stomach's still feeling awesome. But then the next morning I'll make sure I get up and do my session at like 7.30 in the morning, train for like a yeah. good hour and a half. And then I've still got the energy afterwards to work all day. Um, and yeah, do like another little session in the afternoon. Like do some mobility, do some cardio. One meal, boom. Yeah. That's, that's so yeah. I found that was really effective back in uh, when I was doing my performance protocols. There was that kind of kind of meal, and uh, so how much are you getting in in that one meal at the moment? You know, about a kilo. Oh, easy, easy, definitely. Like we had a we had a tray of um, <laughs> so good. You know, it worked out to be two trays of lamb chops in the oven that we had. Um, I think Michaela had. You had like four or five, four, four. four or five. They're only like little small, small chops, but I would have had at least, yeah, I would have had at least 10 chops, <laughs> 10, like small chops, about palm size. So that would have been, yeah, a kilo, 1200 kilo, like 1200 grams or something like that. Awesome. Yeah, that's the way you got to do it. We'll get into more how that works as well. And yeah. No, nah, what? And that Mick as well. What have, what have, what has been your your standard at the moment? So uh, we can talk about these examples with uh, the people listening in. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm currently doing is I'll have my first meal at around twelve o'clock, um, and that's usually like maybe a bowl of beef mince or a steak or something like that. And then um, I'll have the same dinner as Dan. So we'll have either like chops or steak or yeah. So I'm eating probably around. I reckon. Maybe around 600 to 700 grams of meat a day. I reckon uh -huh. about that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I'm um, feeling amazing. Like it's just been something that I've been able to sustain for a long time. Like I've tried many different diets. I've tried like vegan. I've tried veggie. I've tried literally everything. <laughs> and um, this is the one that I've been able to sustain the longest and have really good body composition results from it because like I've – tried doing the whole calorie deficit thing and my body didn't I don't know if maybe I wasn't doing it right maybe I lacked education but I was a wasn't able to change my body composition until I started this carnivore diet which is something that I've been working on for since we've been mm. seeing each other which is like how long like nearly three, three years. years yeah yeah so yeah that's awesome and you yeah. can see that more like the um 
the calorie deficits and the weight loss that most people experience where they feel tired, they're hungry all the time, they're lethargic. Yeah. Uh, you guys, uh, you can see that your brains are highly critical and always adapting. The juggling is looking insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 It's going up. The mobility is going up. So this is the, the no-brainers that people need to look into. It's like you're losing weight, but you're gaining strength, you're gaining lean tissue. Your brain is full of energy and very focused. The mental acuity is on point. Mm. These are some of the things that um, the just natural fasting aids us with. So I yeah. guess let's go down into um, some of the effects mentally before we go into the physical side. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. So... Um, when people generally uh, feel hunger, they, they try and eat right away. That's just a common thing, right? Mm. And for us in the tribal world, hunger means hunt. So it doesn't mm. mean that you need to eat right away. It means that you need to stop preparing to find food because that rumbling in your stomach is not actually your stomach. Most people go, oh, my stomach's rumbling. No, that's your intestine. That's called peristalsis, the subconscious vibration of movement in your intestine that moves food and waste nutrients down the line towards your colon and mm. that means yeah you're gonna need food in a few hours so not right away yeah we are. you have space to assimilate more food so therefore hunger means hunt yeah i like that. And people, like that yeah people need to become more in tune with what that feeling is and what deep hunger is so when people are starting off, generally like as a good reset, it's good for them to try a 24-hour fast or up to a three-day fast to really understand what hunger and deep hunger really is. Mm. Because coming to the end of 24 hours is when it generally starts getting difficult and real hunger starts to set in. And mm. if you can last up three days and see that that hunger actually goes away again and your mm. body then starts to assimilate its own damaged and old cells for food and the gut bacteria and starts to cleanse and assimilate ketones from the liver, then you start to realize, oh, actually, this machine is so clever for survival that um, I don't need to pump it full of food. This is how most people say, oh, my brain will break down. I'll lose muscle if I don't eat. Those are the common fears we see. But when they do this and they experience the heightened mental state and why is that happening? Well, you're first now getting a stable, clean energy source without the disruptive blood sugar roller coaster of death. So <laughs> you're getting a steady flow um, of energy to the brain without disruptions, without sending blood to the digestive systems. So you see that when your body isn't in that parasympathetic state, from eating and then you're trying to work out, you actually have more blood flow and more oxygenation going to your brain and muscles. Therefore you're able to perform better. And this is built in us for survival because when that hunger means hunt and you haven't got any stores or it's been a while since you've been able to successfully hunt, your body needs that heightened state, that energy flowing around to different parts of the body mm. to make you survive, to make you get off your ass and be focused on the mission, which is mm. to survive. And now we can utilize that for training. Yeah. But I'm going to talk about eating before and different patterns depending on your goals. But for most people that are, have some weight on their frame that they want to get rid of or are looking to perform extremely well and don't have much stress in their life, the stresses of fasting to get that mental acuity and to use up your own animal saturated fats, that visceral fat stored in you, that's why fasting is really important. And if you're eating of highly nutritious, highly easily digestible and assimilable relationship to food, which is a meat-based way of eating, you know, fat, you know, fuels all the cholesterol, the hormonal activity in our body, the nutrient transfer into our body and protein creates glycogen stores, uh, methylates the body and creates new lean tissue. So if you're giving that to the body, which is why they're called essential nutrients that we can't make ourselves and that we are voraciously hungry for, you're going to satiate the body and you're going to be able to go into that fasting. You're not going to think about food as much. Mm. And something that our ancestors had no choice to face in most seasons, apart from the short windows, depending if you're like a Northern hemisphere type of um, tribe and ancestry, you had no choice but to face this um, mechanical uh, inbuilt system of your body on, mm. on like a daily basis, a seasonal basis. Yeah. So we can utilize that now. And this is what we're seeing now. Like you lost 12 kilos in two months just by using this system naturally. And not to think about it, the body just subconsciously desires it and does it. Mm. Yeah. And you just 
carry on with your task and you may not be hunting now you may not be starving for food but your training is your hunting you know if mm. you look at most sports and training it's our desire to hunt just masked into something else mm. yeah. if you look at like sports right like um ball sports and like fighting and things like that that's the inbuilt hunting in us to chase something catch something um deal damage or to be put in a stressful situation we all have that you know that adrenaline rush and we just we're just covering it up with different sports and um different training now and yeah. just well, if you're doing it fasted that stress on the body is going to help stay youthful it's going to help the body uh, want to clear magnet cells. So like cell program death, autophagy. These are things that only kick in when you fast. So mm. I guess let's go down into the science of it now. We just kind of had like an ancestry kind of anthropological view in it. But yeah. the science, when you're fasting, and this will tie back into how you both are on different fast patterns and how it affects women differently and people under different chronic stresses. So this is why you need to just not do a certain thing and focus on a time. You need to fill out what your body needs and move your fast patterns around that. Mm -hmm. So when you're entering a fast, first thing that happens is you're going to tap into glycogen stores. When you're eating in a carnivorous way, you're eating in excess of protein, not like ketosis or other diets where you have a balance of everything or I suppose what people think is a healthy balance. But um, when you eat that amount of protein, the body is so hungry for protein is extremely important because mm. the excess after you've created lean tissue, you've created the hormonal desire, you've um, worked on the nervous system, it turns into stores, glycogen stores in your liver and in your muscle. First thing you're going to do when you start fasting is you're going to tap into those stores. This is the body's incredible way of keeping you fueled and alive. It's making glycogen stores. And obviously the brain's preferred method and the quickest method is glycogen. So you're going to use that, but we want to be metabolically flexible and use some fatty tissue and ketones also. As you are utilizing these stores, you've got that energy, but then that energy doesn't last long. If you're training or doing um, a lot of um, endurance or long stamina bouts of energy, you're going to run those stores dry pretty quickly. So then the body wants to tap into the fats of the body and start using that along with ketones. And generally, when you start using this, um, you're starting to then also let the body search and look for cells that are damaged in the body and pockets of bacteria that do not serve you well anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is a cleaning state. This is what autophagy is. This is what cell program death is. It's your immune cells going through engulfing breaking down the tissues that are no longer serving you and then because you're not eating you're allowing waste to be removed at the same time so it's a state of deep cleaning mm. so that 23 hour fast that you're doing is allowing you to destroy all of these cells that are duplicating in appropriately or signaling inappropriately and the fat stores that you've had on your body from previously that's why it's so effective mm. and then when you eat and especially when you've caused stress that allows the body to build your body then has a new foundation to build on rather than building on top of a damaged foundation so you're building nice new clean tissue which is staying, keeping you lean and keeping your muscle mass and your amino acid stores clean so that fasting stress, it, it starts with the body. Um, once it senses that your glycogen stores are low and your blood sugar drops, as we know, insulin is a growth-like factor and cortisol is an atrophy stress hormone that is released by the adrenals. So when insulin drops, cortisol comes in and that cortisol is what ignites the reaction to start your body autophagizing. You need that stress response. So fasting is a big stress on the body, but a necessary one that most humans in the wild or in third world countries face on a daily basis, which is why you don't see much obesity in mm. those countries as mm. well. Yeah. Um, and I'm not just talking obviously the ones that have and got much food nutrients and such, but I'm talking about those that hunt regularly and do, you'll see that they're just very well sculpted. They may not have like the most shredded six pad. They're not aesthetic builders, or yeah. the most muscular, but they're generally pretty lean. You don't see much obesity in them. Yeah. And gluconeogenesis, um, the process of which your body can then turn 
um, old uh, proteins into glycogen as well. But it's also started by this cortisol reaction and that gets the body recycling. So the body is very adapt and built on recycling and adaptation, mm. which ties in with the cholesterol. If your cholesterol is high, you should have good LDL to take the nutrients into the mitochondria and get them firing better for this process to give you that good physical energy and mental clarity. But also you need that high HDL because with every exchange of this, as you said, you've got old cells dying off. You've got um, more energy being made. There's also more waste being created. Then you want that HDL to come along to allow your liver to recycle the, uh, the waste and also get rid of it. Yeah. But when it comes to that stress that we're holding on into the body, like for some people, if they're chronically stressed already from either relationships, emotional work, they're doing a lot of high intensity training and they're not keeping up with allowing good parasympathetic, allowing good rest and allowing their adrenals to rest. So they're adrenally fatigued or adrenally sympathetic dominant. Mm. Then that kind of fuss you're doing that is going to be pretty destructive and they'll actually find that they won't burn fat because their body will be in a state of survival mm. hold on to it because it feels like it's constantly you know things are going on all the time and uh it's not going to suit them so more of a pattern where they're eating twice to three times a day breaking their fast earlier perhaps going for a fast that um is more into the late evening overnight rather mm. than the morning throughout the day because their body may not be able to handle this and this comes down to like most uh, women actually are affected by this. So a lot of women that aren't eating well are highly stimulated, adrenally fatigued. When you're adrenally fatigued, you dampen the thyroid and the pituitary gland has to work even harder. Mm. And then some women are menstruating properly or on hormonal drugs and such. If they're fasting too long, then that state of clearing may be too much stress on their body when they actually need to focus on rebuilding the glands, fueling more hormones, and are actually allowing the body's metabolism to regulate and not be meta chronically metabolically dysregulated or metabolic syndrome is a chronic disease we see where the mitochondria can no longer function at full capacity. Mm. So people need to take into account that the main point is fasting is a stress. It's extremely beneficial if you need to clear the body and um, drop your weight. But if you're chronically stressed, your fast pattern needs to be more adjusted to mm. suit what you can be in parasympathetic. And for some people, that's only when they go to sleep. During mm. the day, they're all over the place. Yeah. So most women, most uh, guys in that state, you don't want to be fasting too long. You want to just allow the clearing. You want to be focusing on getting your cholesterol right and getting your hormones in proper shape. The body's yeah. priority in life, every second of the day, all the, uh, the chemical equations and combustions that are going on is to regulate hormones. That's priority. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we are. You can, um, I've, I've noticed as well, like since fasting and eating this carnivore diet, I've been able to feel more attuned with what's going on within my body. So I've been able to have that a bit, a bit of a better awareness in regards to what my needs are when I can, when I should be eating, things like that. So I feel like this has brought me back to my, um i guess that that intuition by following these kind these kind of protocols beautiful yeah mm -hmm. i mean that's that's a good point to take away there it's be intuitive about it don't mm -hmm. just listen to that influencer that's like oh 12 8 that's intermittent fasting and then you're gonna eat this many calories mm -hmm. so you do 12 8 you pretty much stress your body out completely and then you don't need the right nutrient balance when you are breaking your fast and then you're so stressed now on top of getting everything right. And then, yeah, mm. you just end up destroying your thyroid. And that's why we see that the huge majority of women nowadays have thyroid issues. And I've mm. worked with over like 30 clients now, all female. I've not worked on one guy with thyroid issues. All female, wow. um, droid thyroids, Hashimoto's, hypo, hy um, yeah, hypo and uh, hypothyroids. I just, yeah, it's, it's so mm. destructive. Um, these are women that starve themselves, um, chronically fatigued from the stresses of life and not understanding the, the uh, biochemistry behind the fasting, just following something. And then they're eating carbs and then binging here and there. And then they're mm -hmm. raising that insulin. As you said, that insulin-like growth factor 
that's a rate of growth and you only want that for short periods of time like how it's when like what's working for you dan is you fast you go through that pattern you're not really stressed you do all your breath work practices so you're able to have your autonomic nervous system balanced you're able to get into parasympathetic in the morning or after training and you're regulating this really well so then you're able to deal with the fast and stress clearing all of that you're looking you for you're promoting your longevity and then boom you have that huge meal you feel that cholesterol you feel all that building for the amount of stress you just had to repair the tissues and keep growing lean tissue which is mm. the key to longevity having those amino acid stores but then at the same time you're spiking that insulin for only like an hour or two mm. and that insulin is going all right growth hormone time let's send all of those pieces and components to the right area because this guy is going to burden us again tomorrow and we want to be ready for it and, uh, yeah <laughs> and that's happening. it's yeah. so clever. yeah so so i think um one so, yeah one point i liked actually that you um brought up in the in our like that seminar that you did at our facility was you said uh how do you word it it was like the more the more muscle you've got on your body the the better longevity and it that sort of comes back to the amino acids that have stored on your body hey yeah your bone marrow mm. yeah i thought that was a really cool yeah. point yeah, I mean, if you look at um, like tribal societies, um, when they made a hunt, they didn't ration it out. They, uh, everyone got their pieces. Um, depending who you were in the tribe, you got certain things. Uh, like, for example, uh, women and children would be given um, the fattiest cuts and the organs, especially if they're pregnant or menstruating or certain developmental ages of the child, you'd be given the organs for the nutrient density for their growing tissue and then the hunter men would just feast on all of the protein yeah. you know, to keep the lean tissue to keep them building and to keep themselves strong for the tribes and other bits and off cuts that most people prioritize were just given to the dogs or pets hmm. <laughs> you know but that's that's how it, that's how it was so we are seeing now that muscle and bone marrow is directly correlated to longevity so the more muscle you have and the denser your bone marrow, which you get from resistance training and eating a shitload of meat, <laughs> you know, you're, you're going to have more amino acid stores, which obviously think about this. If you're ill, this is how it works. Think of it in a modern time from an ancestral time. If you're ill, if you're injured, if there's no food shortage, the more muscle mass and bone marrow you have, the more nutrients you have to, to autophagize and gluconeogenes, gluconeogenicide into energy. So you mm -hmm. can keep going for longer until you're able to find food. If you don't have those stores, you don't have the energy to keep looking for food, to keep surviving and repairing through the injury or the illness, and to support the other members of your tribe. So that's how you got to think of it nowadays as well. Now, like... If you don't have those stores, you can't get over your illness, you miss out on work. If you don't repair quickly as an athlete, you miss out on work. You miss out on goals. Within two weeks, you lose muscle mass and strength. You know, it's things like that. So not only do you miss out financially, you miss out physically. So mm. keep those amino stores high and up. Yeah, I like that. Mm. That's awesome. I've noticed as well, like um, when we went through the whole process, when our gym was shut and everything like that, like I didn't do heavy strength training for about, I think it was about two weeks. And um, uh, my strength was able to stay the same just by maintain, maintaining this carnivore diet. So I was able to keep my, like my, my strength remained exactly the same. Like I did the same amount of, same deadlift, same squat, same bench as I was two weeks ago, even though I didn't even do any sort of strength training in that two weeks. So it was pretty cool to see. There you go. I mean, I can relate to that. I just had um, my motorcycle accident. And so mm -hmm. it was two weeks away that I had the surgery. And I spent a week outside the gym. I just fasted out the medicine. Then I just ate and ate so much red meat and, and seafood to get the anti-inflammation, get the repair. And then I went back to, I just took it easy the first few days coming into the second week. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to train some handstand push-ups. And the strength was just all there. Like, so I good. Already, already healed. I wasn't on any anti antibiotics, no painkillers. Just, yeah, just healed, movable, straight back to it. Yeah, so good. that's epic.
that's amino acid stores and that's eating well for recovery. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. And, um, like when you, when you're going through them processes and stuff, like with the healing, do you find like you, the, the seafood just helps bring down inflammation a lot? Does it? I find more, more the fasting. So I don't fast. This is another example. So I don't fast as long as I normally would. I mm. just, I, I maybe go about, I go down to about 12 to 16. Yep. Other than like general 18 or 20. And that allows, um, because in, infection and breakdown of your body happens from within. Like people are still twisted in the idea that infection comes from outside. Mm. Infection is your body's um, inability to process toxins and to allow your immune system to eat away at tissue that doesn't serve you. So if you think when you get an infection, it's your body trying to eat away at tissue that has broken down and your cytokines are trying to react to it to get to get rid of tissue that is um, creating a waste that's harmful to your body. You don't really get infection. You don't really need antibiotics if you've got good cholesterol and you've got a clean system that is um, optimal at repair. Mm. So therefore, that waste happens because of the damaged cells in the area, let's say a cut or a wound like how I had. Um, what's going on is that when those cells are breaking down and they're damaged, your body is extremely fast at going in there getting rid of that waste and sealing it up with new tissue. So mm. therefore your rate of infection is very, very low. That's why cholesterol and you see elders that are very old, their cholesterol is extremely high because the only way to be immunely strong is to have high cholesterol. Yeah, well. Mm. So I don't fast as long. I make I eat a lot more fat than I normally would. And yet I get the seafood fats, the DHA, to uh, help with the angiogenesis balance and remove some of the inflammation around the tissues so that when I do go into angiogenesis, it can flood in with the right nutrients to repair. And that's yeah. why I heal and my athletes heal amazingly fast with no infection or need for pharmaceuticals that are dampening and stressing out the liver and kidneys. Mm. Yeah. We want those two to be the most clean and effective. Like, <laughs> that's like so it. Without them, then you will fall into infection. Then your body will not be able to clear and the infection will grow from the inside. It doesn't grow from something on the outside. It grows from the inside, the infection. Yeah. So, yeah, you need to be super resilient there in order to heal up fast. And then obviously, if you've got that clean and then all the building tissue you're eating is going to help your your blood and um, your, your systems to form a bond and create new tissue and uh, seal the wound. Yeah. Mm. it's crazy it. how um just by following some sort of like just by eating a carnivore diet you can literally heal your body like that like it's just it's so simple when you put it like that it doesn't have to be complicated yeah, <laughs> yeah. Doesn't have to be complicated. i mean if you're not putting any any decorative foods on the side you're not inhibiting your body so mm. i mean i don't want to go too far away from the fasting bit just yet but mm. we'll definitely get into the anti-nutrients and stuff like that yeah but um yeah, like with the with the fasting, um, pretty much any chronic disease I've worked with, after establishing the person's uh, level of stress and and getting that down, um, incorporating breath work, um, incorporating uh, grounding, incorporating um, the right type and style and volume of training for their body, when we start to get them into a deeper fast state and get them very nourished at each meal. The fasting um, heals so many injuries that so many people that have like going to go into shoulder or knee surgery, mm. fix that on. they haven't got a torn ligament. Like, what are you going into surgery for? And within a month, they're like, oh, I didn't need to go for the surgery. I'm completely fine now. You know, things like that. Or chronic bowel issues, chronic um, gland issues, just over months mm. to two months, sometimes three months at the most, just start to start to go away. That's huge, hey? Like, because you, you look at that and you're like, there's such potential. Like, you're literally saving someone from going into a surgery, which could like potentially give them more issues in the future when they get older. Like, it's mm. huge, yeah. so yeah. big, man. And it's um, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. It's cool. Like, uh, and you're also like incorporating some breath work and stuff now as well in your programs. Oh yeah, I, I always have. Not oh, to the depth that you when we um when we did our when we did our session. Yeah. 
like that's that's next level and um i've learned a lot from you and i still do that sometimes but um, i haven't got the knowledge extent that you have to promote that for the right kind of people but yeah. generally my breath work um that i've always put in uh, my performance programs even in the adaptation for generally everyone is just laying in corpse pose as soon as you wake up mm. and getting the diaphragm moving and getting your body woken up but yeah it's it's that's fundamental it. stuff there. yeah and going back to um actually like when you're talking about like saving people from surgeries and helping them cure diseases through fasting the first time i ever discovered fasting was i ended up finding this book it was so funny like um i was cleaning out an old family friend of ours bookshelf and um he said oh you know you can help yourself to some of my books and i found this old dusty book from paul c braggs i'm not sure if you've heard of paul c braggs before he was the apple cider vinegar guy um oh, yeah yes i have yeah so he um i found a book and it was all about like fasting um of him and he was born with a degenerative disease um what was it it was some form of degenerative disease when he was younger and he got sent away to this place over in europe that was curing people through fasting and i think he was there for like six to nine months and he like massively improved this degenerative disease to the point where he lived like a ripe old age of like, you know, up into his seven, like late seventies or eighties healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Was it the fasting miracle of the book? I think it was. Yeah. I think it was. Yeah, I've, read that. I've read that one. Yeah. I know you're talking of, I read that yeah. about, yeah, I read that like seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Good book. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, it's just like amazing. The power of power of fasting, you know, like to be able to cure things like that, it's huge. Mm. It's huge, yeah. Just allowing the body to um, not only clean itself, but just self-regulate and reset, like starting mm. it fresh. So they say from the from the fifth fifth day onwards, um, every day is like reversing a year of life. Wow! Wow! That's huge. And like dry fasting, that starts from about three days. So wow. it's even faster, but we still have people taking it a bit too far. We still get people that fast for like 20 to 30 days. And that to me is very wow. highly destructive. Mm -hmm. And people are trying to cure issues just by fasting alone. And it does just work like that mm -hmm. because sometimes your issue is not just about resetting. It's not about just um, atrophying and clearing. It's also a lot of the chronic issues we see today. It's just, some things are not being built adequately or strong enough. And if you fast, you may weaken those further. Mm. Mm. Something like you have so many, like especially like vegetarians and vegans, Tim Sheaf, who's a friend of mine, do you know Tim Sheaf? No, I haven't heard of him. No. Uh, like an influencer, huge in the parkour scene, was a huge vegan advocate for some time. And he's literally uh, gone back to meet, um, I think like last year and um huge differences now but um yeah he was getting chronic issues from starving his body for a vegetarian vegan diet and then he tried to starve himself more with prolonged fast and urine therapy and just completely destroyed his body and then as soon as he ate fish and meat again boom the body started rebuilding body's glands started working again nervous hmm. system started to repair yeah That's yeah wow yeah it's crazy so um, someone asked in the, that's watching, they said that they have an understanding that high calories are to happen on training days. So I think going back to when you were saying that you were still eating a shitload of food when you weren't training throughout your healing process, um, are you able to touch a little bit about are we supposed to have high calories or heaps of food on training days and a bit, little bit less when we're not training? Or is this going back to, again, just listening to your body and... Yeah, listen to your body, but um, you can't overdose on protein. Mm. Like, you, know, you guys know that. You guys follow that now. You can't overdose on protein. You can overdose on fat, but what happens when you overdose on fat? <laughs> you get sick. <laughs> you wake up at 3 a.m. and you have to run to the toilet to either explode your, <laughs> from your backside or your front Whatever method your body prefers, it will let you know. <laughs> or both. <laughs> not in trouble or anything. It's just you. You add too much fat, 
the fats rendered oils after digestion your body can't soak it in this especially happens to the newbies i'm um, adapting in which uh, we put in your course mm. and um, <laughs> that's what happens but even when i'm in hospital in the bed when i can't move and i'm not training i eat the same amount if not more and i don't put on any fat mm. i don't put on any fat all i do is not lose muscle mm. i don't get strong i don't lose strength yeah so when you're eating this the body is so clever the protein is going into stores which are going to use up into your natural fasting pattern whatever you decide to do um, or your gentle movement or your work activities feeling your brain for academic stuff your mental acuity it doesn't turn and store into fat fat doesn't really turn into fat as well it's mostly energy and what is energy empty carbohydrates that are non-essential so if you're not moving much and you're eating energy energy is stored because you're not moving to create to utilize energy so you eat energy when you're not using as much energy it stores if you eat building blocks it continues to build you and it only makes these small stores in your liver mm. if you're eating fat you also don't make much stores you create hormones you create electrical systems of your nervous system you create cholesterol you create intracellular activity mm. therefore this is why on a carnivorous relationship to food or ketogenics you don't you don't put on fat it's easy to stay the same leanness all year round and if you want to get leaner with a high intense amount of training you just lower your fat slightly so your body has to utilize more fat from your body which i don't suggest for women mm. i don't think women should be um less than 10 percent body fat all the time my partner used to do this now she's sitting more around uh 13 to 40 percent and it's more healthy for the hormone regulation it's more healthy for the body but if mm. she wanted to drop more she would up the intensity of your training in terms of weightlifting, hypertrophy intensity um less rest and she would cut down a bit of a fat but at this she would also cut down at the expense of her menstrual cycle fertility mm. thyroid and hormonal regulation mm. but yeah in um in layman's term no you won't you won't have to worry about calories you won't get fat just eating meat and fat Mm. yeah and like like when you said you can't you can't overeat it like mm. I, like i found like sitting down to have like a meal i get to a point where like adopting yeah like adopting that adopting that belief like eat when you're hungry eat when you eat until you're full like i'll sit down and i'll literally eat until i fall and i can't eat anymore like my body will physically tell me no mm. no more you not know? like potato chips like you could sit and eat a whole bag of potato chips even when you're full yeah, like it just, it's so different. You have ice cream. And yeah. You have more room. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with the protein, it's physically impossible to eat an amount that would make you fat. Mm. Physically impossible. You can't. You can't overeat it. Like it's it's so difficult. And that's where you see most tribes as well. That they don't. They're not eating all the time. They're not overeating because they're so satiated mm. after each meal. Yeah. And only, the only time you'll find them snacking is when they're using. Um, second base foods when they're using foods for survival they're using um like starches and berries and fruits like that to get by on and then they may eat more of them they may store some body fat as well to get them through a, a harsh period of time mm. and it's, it's last resource foods these these foods for them and even then they preserve fats to break down these foods in and to keep their brain um supplemented with nutrients mm. they, they knew that um subconsciously from nature yeah yeah it's it's crazy eh? like think it thinking about that it just totally changes the dynamic or the um just like the yeah the understanding of our relationship with food you know like over over the past like 100 years or more it's like like yeah most likely more than that like people have just seen food as such a enjoyment factor like i still enjoy food not yeah. so I don't, don't enjoy it but yeah the relationship with it has changed massively mm. like yeah well over the last hundred years um we had the world wars the world wars brought in rationing brought in calories idea that stuck it has no scientific or actual basis there's no exact way to measure the um the energy of food they just they do kilojoules and calories by burning the food and measuring that which is ridiculous there's no exact way 
They don't look into the hormonal reactions to different foods and macros. And then we're, we're basing off of a system where, where people have started getting refrigeration and access to food and fast food and restaurants started to pop up everywhere. Mm. And then eating became a social thing. And then propaganda started to come in because of corporate greed. Mm. So we started to scare people off of bacteria. So therefore our dairy became less available. Our dairy became pasteurized. Then we started to scare people about fat because of modern diseases created from modern processes that make billions. And the monopolization and control of our foods started to take place. And the war is even bigger now. So therefore people came off fat. Therefore pharmaceuticals took place of natural medicine, which is from cholesterol. Mm. And (laughs) then... And then the elites have now created a global warming to take further control of our food by demonizing the practices of freedom that we have, which is cattle and utilization of our land. Mm. And here we are today. Most of the world is trying to go vegan. 80% of the food in the world is plant-based and grain-based. It's processed. And we have the highest rates of disease now. Yeah. Follow the money trail, follow the corporate influence and agendas, whether it's infertility, whether it's partnering up with pharmaceutical industry, whether it's vaccines for immunity rather than nutrient density. Um, Follow where most of the cropping, monocropping seeds and fertilizers, all of the companies from the world wars, they went from making poisonous gases and poisonous chemicals to kill people Mm. and because they didn't disappear now they make poisonous gases and chemicals to kill little animals and fertilize and put loads of glyphosate and chemicals into our food then further processing chemicals to stabilize and create long shelf lives for foods mm-hmm. <laughs> and i don't want to get too like down that rabbit hole here on this people yeah. only just me, probably <laughs> <laughs> but we need to look into this this is um the deeper foundations as to why certain health organizations and who those people are and where they come from and what they believe were before their earlier generations and CEOs are, are promoting the foods the way they are. And they are helping manipulate people's ideas and relationships around nature and food. It ties in with a lot as to why you see the world today and why those companies are the richest and biggest. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So huge. So huge. Yeah, like um, yeah, like you said, it's big, 